excited to introduce my next guest, novelist, columnist, television writer, 24 years as a monologue writer for David Letterman, during which time he was nominated for 15 Emmys. Please welcome to the show, Bill Sheft. How are you, sir? Thanks for uh, having me, and and what a shock that I was available. <laughs> well, you know, I'm glad you are available so much. For, the, for everyone listening, uh, for the next three hours, we're going to do a deep dive into David Letterman. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, I, so I know you started out as a comic before heading to the David Letterman, and I was stalking your Twitter. I don't call it X. And... It's, I you. saw that your favorite road club is Mark Ridley's comedy club. That's where I am. That's my club. That's where I started doing comedy. And that's where I love the most too. So I was excited to see that as your, you spent a lot of time in Detroit. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, it was a club that I worked twice a year from 1984 to 1992. I, it was the last road club I worked. I got the job at Letterman in October of, 1991 and of course you ask anybody that writes for a television show and you're all always deathly afraid you're going to get fired so i kept a few gigs and that was the last one i did in august of 1992 and uh i loved mark i loved that place it was the and i can safely say this it was the only place on the road where i actually drew people where people came to see me because you know, in the 80s and 90s during the comedy boom, it, it's it's just so tough now to be a comic because, you know, you're required to promote and bring the audience. And back then in the 80s and early 90s, some of these places, all they had to do was really open their doors. And and if they if if their reputation was that they had good acts, people would come. And, and so I was lucky enough to do that. I did that for 13 years and, uh, and I loved uh, the club. I loved the people and I would get up early to do. Um, oh, for God's sake. I can't, no, no. Uh, 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 who would, who was the morning? I love this guy and he's on Twitter as well. Oh my God. I can't believe I'm embarrassed that I can't remember his name. He was also, he was the PA guy for the Pistons. Um, he was the in, in, in arena announcer. For, oh, I can't believe I'm oh so God. embarrassed. And I love this guy. I'll get it. I'll get it. I'll get it by the end of the interview. If you keep me on here long enough, but I <laughs> Ken Calvert. Did I love him? Ken Calvert. I adored him and I would get up at, you know, five in the morning to get in there at six. I mean, five in the morning, which is a time that doesn't exist for a road comic. I'm usually pulling in around five in the morning. And, um, I loved him. He and that's where I met the uh, one of the more brilliant call-in radio guys, a guy named Mark Patrick, who used to call in doing a bunch of different characters, and got to be very good friends with Mark and his son Drew Storen, who pitched in the big leagues for eight years. And uh, and just like he had a co-host named Lynn, who was great. He had a lot of great people and. Uh, that was my, you know, I just loved everything about going to Detroit. It's an amazing club. It's a lot of fun. And Mark Ridley is one of the greatest people in comedy. So he's a great, and you know what I didn't know? And, and, and I believe him. If he says this, he says that he invented the three comic uh, road bill that he invented the opener, the middle and the close. I mean, it, and, and I believe it. If he says it, I believe it. That's what I always heard as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That and he helped produce or something was some behind Tim Allen's breakout special. Oh, either. absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I would uh, I would come in a couple times besides when I would do his club. He would bring me in a couple times a year to do these uh, benefits like the Doug English uh, golf tournament in, in uh, that was down in Texas and or other golf tournaments and Tim Allen, you know, and I knew him before he was Tim and he was just, he was just funny as I mean, and that's to me, he was just funny, Tim Allen. And he had, uh, he used to say to me, you know, he tried for years to get on the tonight show. And, you know, if, if you remember his act, it was quite, quite dirty. <laughs> and, but he had, as he would say, 
He said, I had 20 minutes of clean, clean stuff. And Jim McCauley, the very corrupt booker for The Tonight Show, Jim McCauley would come in to see him, to consider him for The Tonight Show. And as he would say, Jim McCauley always showed up late, always showed up at the 21st minute I was on stage. So he had missed all the stuff. <laughs> and he would just see all the stuff that I couldn't do on the but he was just so he was so strong. He was so strong. There were a lot of a lot of those local acts in Detroit, they were very strong. They they just had a very good um community there of comics. And 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 I think that, that I think Ridley had a lot to do with that. Yeah, Ridley fostered a lot when I was coming up starting doing comedy with the open mics there was wednesday open mics and then there was like a tuesday kind of greatest hits open mic with an improv troupe and then early on when i started before mark uh came to his senses and would book someone for an entire weekend he would literally book the up and coming comics like i would call in and go for thursday or for friday or saturday and that's how you moved up and then eventually it was like you just got the weekend <laughs> Right. So we didn't cross because I stopped at 93 was the month, the last year I did stand up. So no, we, I think I was just starting. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So. But I, I mean, I and, and he also, you know, I've been doing it for however long. And somebody told me a comic told me they said, you, you don't get it, do you? And I went, well, you know, that could that's a big you know, that's a big topic of what I don't get. They said, you don't get it. You don't understand. The liquor bill for the first show Saturday, what they take in at the bar pays for everything, pays for all the acts, all the travel, the hotel. It pays for everything. And and uh, he wasn't referring to it. And Mark really, I have to say, paid fairly. I mean, you really didn't feel like uh you were getting taken advantage you know and, and that's a short list that's a short list and uh and i'll just tell you because again uh the guy that i'm referring to is dead so i can do this so i would come in every six months into the comedy castle and everybody on the staff would say to me oh my god thank god you're here kip Adada was here last week he had 200 walkouts. He trashed his hotel room. He got a waitress pregnant, and he walked out on a $2,000 bar tab. That's it. You know, that's enough. <laughs> and then six months later, I would be back at the same bread, which is fine. Kipadada would be in front of me at a raise and say, oh, we're so glad you're here. He had 300, you know, he would be back six months later. Yeah, but that's what that's the way it was. Kipadada, who was notorious for um, for uh, opening for Diana Ross in uh, Vegas and making the mistake of wearing a light colored suit and, uh, you know, and and peeing himself on stage. During yeah, so that's it, and also getting the crap beaten out of them by Roseanne Barr in the parking lot of the comedy store. And whenever Roseanne was on our show, was on with Dave, he would Dave would say, "Please, just if you could, just could just tell the story about beating up Kipadada in the comedy." <laughs> he said the audience says, "But I need to hear this." So you know, Roseanne would sort of bump her, and then would eventually get to it and then the next uh eventually and then one morning i i get in and there's a long long message from kipadada who i had worked with several times uh we've never met my name is kipadada we've never met we're kid <laughs> spelling his name over and over again is, i i can assure you if roseanne Barr and i got in a fight she would not walk away i can assure you of that and i you know that so that was okay but that's it <laughs> uh -huh. I think it's a good lesson not to wear light colored suits anytime, whether you're going to pee right. yourself or not. Absolutely. And, and I think if we didn't learn that now, we learned that in the remake of a star is born at the, at the, uh, you know, I don't want to ruin the movie for anybody, but that's what 
happens with Bradley Cooper. Right. I okay. would I would always have to go to the bathroom a million times before I would get on stage. So I learned early on, it's not about peeing yourself. It's about splashing yourself in the sink. By right. There's a million ways. Yeah. So, well, yeah. I had a thing. Now that you've opened up this, I, I was <laughs> a comic, like I said, for 13 years. And, and I loved it for the first six years. And then for the last you know, six and a half years, for the last six and a half years, I realized Oh my God, I'm an introvert. I don't. I don't get any energy from the audience. I'm all the energy's coming out of me. And um, I started having this thing where I would I'd get. It would happen on the road where I would, you know, I'd fly in and I'd be, you know, I'd be closing and I would get on stage the first night. And you got to do 45 to an hour, right? You know, right? And uh, from the second. I got on stage until the second I got off stage. I was sure that I was peeing in, peeing in my pants and that they saw it. I felt it. I couldn't. And I said, I can't believe they're not doing anything. I can't believe nobody sees it. I would keep sort of looking. And, um, and then I would, of course, I would run off the stage. And when it was over, go to the bathroom, pull down my bit, bone dry. And and this went through, it was it would be the first night on the road. So finally, I'm working in uh Vegas. They had a club at the Riviera. The doorman was Steve Sharippa. The door, yeah, pre-Sopranos, pre-fat suit, Steve Sharippa. He was the door. And and uh my late wife, the comic Adrian Tolsch, who also loved uh Ridley's Club. And I'm working with her and JJ Wall. We were all friends from Catch Rising Star. We'd all been booked together. And you're only you only have to do like ten minutes at, at the at the Vegas clubs, you know, because they just want to. I have a very funny story I'll tell you after. <laughs> but so uh, and so I'm up the first night and I'm doing the thing and it's my first set, so I'm doing the, you know, and uh, I get off stage and she says, "What's going on?" You kept looking down, so now I got to tell her this thing that you know that's been going on for a couple of years. And she says to me, she waits for me to finish. And she says, sounds like somebody doesn't want to be up there. And, 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 and I stopped performing a couple of years later. I get in the show, get in the job at the Letterman show help. But that was, it was like, it, it indicated to me, you don't really want to do this anymore. And so. If I was up there and someone just would look at me like below eye level, I was sure the entire time I was up there, my fly was down. Well, that of course is that now. Yeah. And also, I did, I did um, uh, evening at the Improv. I did it a couple times. The first time I did it, they had absolutely run out of A, B, C, and D. They were down to the E list, and the guy hosting the, the show at the time, he would have some you know celebrity. But uh, uh, my host was Norm Nixon, you know, L.A. Laker guard you know, run out of town by Magic Johnson. And um, they would give very non-traditional intros, non-show busy intros for evening theater for some reason. I don't know why. So Norm Nixon, this is, this is 80, let's say it's 88. It's the height of the, no, because he was gone by then. So let's say it was 86. It was the height of the Celtics Lakers rivalry. And Norm Nixon gets up there and he says, Our next comedian is originally from Boston. So would you please give a lukewarm welcome for Bill Sheft? And they did. So I'm on stage and I used to work with a cigar. I smoke cigars constantly and I was never without a cigar on stage. And, you know, you're doing six minutes. And about at minute two, I look over into my left hand. I used to hold the cigar in the same hand as the microphone. And I see my hand is shaking. But to me, you know, it looks like this. So, you know, the act, you know, you know, your act cold. The act is coming out of the mouth and you're smiling and the whole thing. And in my head, I just say, okay, Bill, here's what you do. You put the, put the switch hands with the cigar Put in your right hand, put your right hand at the side, and that'll stop the uh, the shaking. Just do that. You know, and I make the switch flawlessly, 
and the act is coming out of the mouth and in the head i just say very good bill that's good you're fine you're fine and then i look over and just my hand with the microphone it's like this still going and for the last two minutes as the act is coming out of the mouth and i'm smiling and getting my laughs in my head I'll never be able to do television again. I'll never be able to do television again. I'll never, you know, it was just crazy. It was crazy. And uh, and I and years later, a thousand years later, Dave gets the Kennedy Center honor. And before the actual event at uh, the Kennedy Center, um, there's a there's a big event the night before at the State Department and different people make toasts and it's a great event. It's really kind of star studded. And so I'm sitting at the table with him, a couple of people from the show. And I look at the table next to me, I see Debbie Allen and I go, well, if Debbie Allen is here. I wonder if her husband, Norm, and sure enough, here comes Norm Nixon. And he sits down at the table next to me and I walk over to him and I say, my name is Bill Sheft. I used to be a comic. That's not important. I would like to do for you now your introduction of me on Evening at the Improv in 1988. <laughs> and I do the whole thing. <laughs> he just <laughs> shakes his head. Sorry, man. Um, but that was uh, that. Was that. that is hilarious. Yeah. That, that now, one funny. more. Oh, you reminded me the Vegas story. I was not in on this, but Mitzi Shore had a club in Vegas at the Dunes. And she had, and you know, and I'm sure you've worked the clubs in Vegas, you know, you know, as a guy told me, you're just a buffet that tells jokes, you know, get them in, get them out. So the shows are very short and you don't have to do too much time. So Mitzi would have like a six act show. So every act was doing 10 minutes. And her closing act was a guy named Ollie Joe Prater, who was a notorious road comic worked everywhere he was a big draw he was also two things about him he liked to lift other people's material and he also weighed 400 pounds so the acts are doing 10 minutes a piece you know 400 pounds it's going to take ollie joe prater 10 minutes to walk onto the stage so what they did this is the god's honest truth they had him back you know just sort of off back of the stage under a boat tarp for the entire show. So Larry Amorose, my best friend, would MC and he'd bring up the other five acts. And it would literally, and now, ladies and gentlemen, your headliner, and pull the boat tarp off. And there'd be Ollie Joe sitting there and he would do his act because they could not afford the time to have him come on stage. That's true. Wow. That, <laughs> I don't even know how to like internalize that exactly because it seems like um how did he feel about that? Or he was just happy to be there. Yeah. I just oh wow. Okay. All right. Yeah. That, that's crazy though. Yeah. Yeah. I guess uh, yeah. I'm not right. gonna say I, I by the way, everything I'm telling you today is true. Oh, I believe everything. I, just, <laughs> I didn't know if you'd feel bad once the tarp was removed or, you know, like if you're in the audience or just laugh it off because I guess, but it just. Well, you know. I mean, I think that, you know, I think that I, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's kind of Vegas y when you think about it. It's almost like a David Copperfield reveal, you know. <laughs> but I he guess. also, at that time, he oh, was man. so heavy. He he did the whole act. He did his whole act sitting down anyway. So wow. this was like friggin' Tuesday for him. <laughs> that is a good story. Uh so who else was uh coming up when you were doing comedy during the I was in video? I was in the I, I like to say that I was a half generation after Jerry Seinfeld maybe started like three years before me, him and Riser and and uh, Larry Miller, they were all about three years before me. I started in 1980, and I auditioned at Catch a Rising Star. And uh, the woman who ran audition night, she didn't took her took me six times to pass, and then I got even with her. I eventually I married her. That was Adrian Tolsh, 
who was the first female MC at Catch Rising Star, and just crazy funny. And the three house MCs at Catch Rising Star were Adrian, Bill Maher, and J.J. Wall, who I mentioned, and, and who used to work Ridley's Club all the time, loved, and Ridley, they loved each other. And 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 I replaced Bill Maher as the house MC after he did his second Tonight Show and moved to L.A. And so that was 82. And uh, and I was there for, you know, five years. And um, and then, you know, I worked all the, you know, all the showcase clubs and all the clubs on the road. And I was in Australia. I went to Australia three times. And, you know, I worked all those clubs all over the, you know, the country. You know, that's what you did. Did you ever ask Adrian, why did it take so long for you to pass me? Yeah, of course I did. Only on a regular basis. Well, I think that she, she said, it, well, she said you were very, she said you were funny, but you were very arrogant and uh, which is not untrue. And, and I think that, um, I think it was probably a little bit of a, 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 a test at work, but it, but of course she always denies that it was six times. Anytime I would tell the story, you know, she would stand behind me, you know, like two, it was two, maybe, maybe it was three. Maybe three. and uh, but that was yeah, that was but but it's it's kind of um it's interesting because it took me six times to pass audition at Catch a Rising Star, and it took me six submissions to get hired at Letterman. So not, you know, that's I guess that's the magic number. Six is the number for you. Yeah. Did you start dating Adrian after she passed you or during the process? About about, about a year later. About, about a year it. later, we dated for three months. And then I might have said something really stupid in front of other comics. And we broke up for nine months. And then we got back together and we stayed together. And we were married. You know, we we're married 26 and a half. We were together 34 years, married 26 and a half years. And she went to heaven seven months. Seven years ago uh, in December, but she was, you know, well, I mean, just fire up the YouTube machine and put her name in. And, um, you know, she was as strong as anybody. She was just as, as funny as anybody. I did. I did dig into her a little bit. It was yeah. uh, it's impressive. You guys, you guys, I read that you guys toured a lot. You guys uh, executive produced Take My Nose, Please together. Yeah, that's my 90. God, she's 95 now. My 95-year-old cousin, Joan Crone, that was her first documentary. And, and we, um, she was, um, uh, she's a fascinating story, Joni. She, career journalist, amazing life, invented the expression high tech. She invented that expression, wrote a book in the early 70s called High Tech. Um and um, so she was always interested in being a filmmaker. So she decided at 88, what the hell? And um, she wanted to do a movie about plastic surgery because she knew more about it than anybody. And she would talk to us and she said, you know, the only people that are open about their plastic surgery or other people's plastic surgery are female comedians. So I said, well, there's your movie. And she said, wait a minute, a movie about female comedians and plastic surgery. And Adrian said, yes, and we'll help you because we, we know everybody. And, and that's, and that's what it was. That's how it started. And um, so, yes, I adore her. And uh, she worked on, uh, she's finishing up her second film, Joni. She lives in Florida now. She used to live seven blocks away from me. 95, she's 95 now and still working. She's amazing. That is amazing. Every, yeah. If anyone wants to check out this movie, it's a great documentary. Take, it, take my nose, please. It's, uh, I guess it was, yeah, 2017. It came out. Yeah, it came out and got a lot of awards in the festival circuit and still, uh, yeah. and. Um, it was the first, um, you know, it's funny because she said to me when the thing started going, she said, you know, uh, because it was your, because you and Adrian kind of gave me the idea and encouraged me to do this, I'm making the two of you executive producers. So I never, I always hated the idea of being a producer, but I took it very seriously. And so I said to her, 
well, okay, since I'm the executive producer, how are you doing with money? She said, well, she said, we're about $250,000 short. I said, come on. I went to school with a bunch of billionaires. I'll get you that money in the in a weekend. And I started reaching out to all the really, really rich guys that I had gone to prep school and college with. And, you know, there's a reason why billionaires are billionaires, because they don't invest in documentaries. <laughs> so I did not come through for her at all in that regard. Who's looking to quadruple your money? What do you got? I got this yeah, documentary. Right. It's called Take yeah. My Nose. Please. 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 Yeah, right. <laughs> It was really good though. It's um, you can get it on Tubi. I think you can get it on Amazon. It's it's pretty much everywhere. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's it follows two comedians and then has stuff on Phyllis Diller. Yeah. Your wife's in it. So uh, so what do we got? Oh, so and I still work in. I I mean I I still work in documentaries. I work um I worked in a couple. Um, currently working on a friend of mine, Eric Drath, who is a brilliant filmmaker. He's putting together a documentary series about Don King that I'm helping him out with. And um, he's, you know, there's a lot of, there's a million great documentaries. There's a million great sports documentaries. In my opinion, Eric Drath did pound for pound the best sports documentary I ever saw, which was on Renee Richards. He did it for ESPN um, years ago. And it's as good as anything uh, you'll ever see. And so he's done a lot, mostly boxing. So I'm working with him on that. I worked with him on the, on a film about uh, Hector Macho Camacho. And, you know, I help out. I've been working on a documentary about Richard Belzer for, I don't know now, about six years and that's moving along. So this is what I do now. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. My friend is, uh, he's a comic also, Bob Phillips. He's, he was a boxer, and so he is always talking about some kind of documentary or movie about boxing. He loves, he loves, loves, loves that. Um, so it's such a, it's so, it's, why is it so fascinating? I, I think I know. It's so fascinating because it is just an openly lawless sport and pursuit. And so, of course, you're going to have the most compelling characters in it. That's yeah, it's why. always it's always a great story. Someone who comes from nothing and then can all of a sudden be worth right. millions upon millions, and maybe lose it and then win it all back again. And right. there's just all these amazing stories. Yes, I wanted to talk about the truants. The truants. The truants. I wanted to talk yeah. about the truants. Um, I did want to say what caught my eye originally was you made a comment about it was an obligatory comment about just reminding people that the Supremes charted four times after Diana Ross on your Twitter. I thought that was kind of funny. Well, yeah. that's, you know, every, not every Saturday, but I would say three out of four Saturdays a month, I uh, run back. I have to get back to my house at noon and fire up the 70s channel on Sirius where they replay a random week from the American Top 40 in the 70s. And there's a bunch of us on Twitter, because you and I are just calling it Twitter, who live tweet about the, the, the list as they're playing at the chart. And I like to crack wise. And it is so much, uh, I, I I love it. I love the people. Um, I love how serious it gets in terms of how strongly people feel, you know, and, um, and, and there's only one rule. You are absolutely forbidden to refer to an, a, a song on the chart before it plays. Don't ruin the chart for the rest of us. And uh, so that that is the only you get uh, you get really scolded if that happens. But, yeah, the Supreme. Yeah, I'm I, I'm endlessly. Yeah, that's I'm kind of fascinated by that. And I bring it up every time there's a Gene Terrell 
song on there. Your band, interestingly enough, and this ties into one of the novels that you wrote, Time Won't Let Me. You wrote that and then sort of and then started this uh band yeah. where you only play music uh 1967 or before, which is great. You can see I got a beat. Yeah, it. we're 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 very niche and um and I'll tell you what happened. So Time Won't Let Me is a book inspired by the story of my brother's band, The Rising Storm. He went to Phillips Academy, Andover, in the early 60s. And he had a band. He was in a band called The Rising Storm. And they were they were pretty good. They played dances. And they decided to make an album like every garage type band did back in the 60s and 67 before they graduated and unlike every other album they added five original songs it wasn't all covers and they were also just a little better than most bands like that and 15 years later in 1982 the boston phoenix publishes an article do you know this band because their album, Calm Before, is now worth $2,500. Because there were so few, and they happen to be better. So my sister reads this, calls my uh, calls the guy that wrote the piece, and the guy said, this is the guy you need to call. He's a collector. And she calls this guy. The guy's name was Ron Fantasia. And she says, I'm Harriet Sheft. I'm Tom Sheft's sister. I said, oh, my God, you know, he's from Boston. I feel like I'm talking to Ringo's sister. And he got the band back together to play a few gigs. And then collectors love this band. So for years, they would reunite. And the album became more and more valuable. It's now worth like $10,000. If you have an unopened original copy of Calm Before. Well, so this story kind of started breaking in 82, 87. So I, when I was thinking about a, an idea for a second novel, I said, this, this is a great story, what happened to my brother. But it's a little too, a little too clean, a little too cute. So I'm going to make it 15 years later. And the album is worth $10,000, ironically, what it's worth now. And these guys are all 48. It's, you know, it's 30 years later. And it's the album, you know, rather than 15, it's 30 years later. These guys are all 48, and they can't get out of their own way to get back together. And I named the band The Truants. And so the book comes out, does pretty well. I get, you know, nominated for, I run her up for the Thurber Prize for American humor and, but all and all the reviews for the book are, this is the most accurate depiction of a band behind the scenes that I've ever, and, and I'd never been to band. I just observed my brother and heard stories. And so a guy writes me who's uh, gigs regularly and he's raving about it. And, he, and I said, are you gigging? In New York, he says, yeah, we got a gig down at Auto Shrunken Head, which is a classic bar that has bands down the Lower East Side. So I went and saw him. He had a surf band. And the Thurston Howells was the name of his band. That's a great name. Yeah. Or no, no, no. Excuse me. The Howling Thurstons. That's the name of his band. So I go and I see him in there. Great. And I go up to him between sets and I say, the only thing that would have made it better is if your drummer had dropped out of a heart attack. And then I would have had, I could have subbed in and I hadn't played in years. You know, I used to play on the road. I would go sit in or whatever I would do. And, and he said to me, do you, do you play? I said, no, but I, I would love to play. So well, you should join this musicians collective called the studio. And I did. And I started playing at jams. I got my chops back, but I got tired, you know, in a jam, when you're in a jam, the singer calls the shots and uh, I'm not thrilled with that. So I decided after a year or so, a couple of years, I'm going to start my own band because I'm tired of playing Neil Young and this nonsense. And so I 
put an ad in Craigslist and I found a couple guys who didn't rape or kill me. And, and we started this band and I just wanted to jam and practice. I never wanted to play out because we've gone over how I'm done being on stage, but you know, they wanted to play out and we started doing it. This was 2010. So it's now we're coming up to 14 years later. And, and we've had, we had a few changes early on, but we essentially had the same guys for years. And it was, and I wanted to play the stuff that my brother played, which was nothing after 1967, but we opened it up a little more um, British invasion, which he didn't do. And, but a lot of garage. So we're garage and British invasion covers and we play all over and we have the benefit of being good. That's awesome. That's yeah. really cool. That's really, really cool. And and I, and, and when, and when they wanted a name, they said, what are we going to name the band? I said, well, I don't care what we name it going for, but just for one night, I'd like it to be the truants, which was the name of the band and time won't let me. And they said, no, that's great. So that's what, it, why it's the truants. I love that. That's a great story. As you're telling the story, I mean, I know two of you have written five books, five, two of them are optioned for films, but this isn't one of them. This one no. seems like it would be a great film. Yes. And I think that I always, um, I had a little interest from Tom Hanks, but it was just so close to that thing you do. He just didn't want to go down that road again, but he, he was very, yeah. And, um, yeah. And also there's, and, and I also, it, it has more characters than any of my other novels. So I thought it was, it would be one of those great things for, you know, George Clooney to get the gang back together, but they're all way too old now. But, uh, yeah, I thought it would make a good movie. Yeah. It could have been a good sequel to that thing you do. It's, yeah. Getting, yeah. Like, Boy, that like, movie. And you know, Tom Hanks, he, he, whenever he talks about that thing you do, he says, you know, it was the first film I ever directed. I made so many mistakes. I would love to, you know, have the chance to do it over again. And I'm thinking you, you're nuts. I've seen it a billion times. I don't know what you're talking about, but that's that, you know, that's that thing that, uh, that's that thing we do. He told right. a great story on Letterman to promote the movie where Dave said to, uh, what was it like being a director? And and Hank says, I didn't understand the power that a director has overall. He says, like the second day, I'm having a conversation with just some guy. And it's not about the movie. We're just having a conversation and I happened to say to him, oh, you know what? I love turkey jerky. And somebody on the crew overheard me. And for the rest of the shoot, there were carcasses hanging and drying and different flavors. And just because I had over, they, somebody overheard me say that I like turkey jerky. I, I think the jury's out, whether that's because he was the director or because he was Tom Hanks. <laughs> well, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's well, I don't think you're well, excellent <laughs> point. So you think that he could have gotten away with that on a, a movie that he was the starring vehicle for, is what you're saying. I'm saying if I'm sitting around and I hear Tom Hanks go, I like turkey jerky, and I want to get in with Tom Hanks, I'm getting right. me some turkey jerky. So you're so wow, <laughs> interesting. Okay, I, I agree. I yeah, I I see yeah, sure. I mean, from Tom Hanks' point of view, I believe that's right. what he thought. <laughs> uh, that's why. Um, and since we're on Letterman for a second, so you replaced Bill Hicks one night on Letterman? Yes. Now, Bill Hicks, this is uh, uh, so my wife, who was the house MC at Catch a Rising Star, every, and, and played on the road a lot, every once in a while, she would and 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 we had a lot of power because the MCs decided who went on. So she works on the road with Emo Phillips, and she gets back to New York and she calls Bob Morton and she said, "I got a I got a comic you need to see, and will you see him the next time he comes to New York?" So Morton comes in, he sees Emo, 
he sees him a couple more times and then emo gets booked and that's it. And, and I had the same experience with Morton, with Margaret Smith. I got Margaret Smith on the show. And now Adrian goes to Houston. She sees Hicks who I had seen in Atlanta and I thought, it, but I, I never, I would never put together like seeing, Oh, perfect for Letterman. I just, but she did. So she calls Morton and she says, I saw an act. You need to come in and see him. His name's Bill Hicks. He's from Houston. And, and, uh, Morton says, well, look, you know, we did very well with emo. So I'll come in. Now, a lot of people take credit for Bill Hicks getting on, but it was Adrian. Wasn't Jay, you know, it wasn't uh, other people. It was Adrian. So Hicks goes on the show. He he sees him, Morton sees him once, books him on the show. He does the show eight times at NBC, and he's one of Dave's absolute favorites. So now here we are. We're at CBS. We're on five weeks. And Stephen Wright was the first comic that we booked. And Hicks might have been the third. Maybe we had, maybe Carlin came on and maybe Jerry, I don't know, but we were on five weeks. It was our 25th show and they book Hicks and Hicks and I were all old friends and I work on the, you know, we got along great. I was very fond of him for a million reasons. And, um, and also one of the writers on the, on the Letterman show back then was one of my good friends and a great comic, Jeff Stilson great comic and a very popular comic on the old Letterman show as well. So Stilson is now on staff. So Hicks, uh, he's backstage. I go to say hi to him before he comes and he's not dressed, no leather, no black. He's got a yellow button down Oxford shirt and a, and a yellow tweed jacket. It's like, it's like he raided my closet. And I say to him, what's with, he said, this is the new friendlier Bill Hicks. And I go, oh, great. So now he comes out and he does the set and he does, he does, does fine, but it's not what it's, it, there's, there's some things about it. And I'm thinking, well, maybe I'm imagining this it seems a little, not quite Hicks like to me. This seems some stuff that's a little gratuitous or whatever, but I think, well, you know what? He does great. And then he sits with Dave and Dave says to him, Hey, uh, have fun reading your mail. That's the last thing Dave says to him. <laughs> so now I go upstairs to, we were on the eighth floor back then, the writers and Stilson's waiting for me. And Stilson says, Oh, I go backstage afterwards and I tell Hicks, you did great. He said, really? Do you think, did Dave, like I said, Dave was laughing at the dancing bit. Dave was, yeah. And he was working at Caroline's that night. And I said, I'll come see you at Caroline's. He says, great. So um, I go upstairs and there's Stilson's waiting for me. And he says, and Stilson and him were very close. Stilson goes, what the fuck was that? What if that opening joke was so hacky and what well, that was so weird, the choices. And so now I begin to think, well, maybe what I thought wasn't wrong. And um, so basically what happened was they, um, the show thought, look, we've only been on five weeks. There's a lot of stuff that, you know, is, would be tough to defend or whatever. So let's, let's, you know, and it shouldn't have been approved by the segment producer. They kind of lay it on the, which they, you know, and, and, um, and, and we'll, we'll take care of it and we'll assure him that we're going to have him back. And, and, you know, we just won't do a couple, he won't do a couple of the bits, you know, like the abortion bit or whatever. And that was, as, as I know, in retrospect, that's what happened. So I come up, it's a Friday to say goodbye. And I was doing the audience warm up back then. And, and, uh, I come up to say goodbye to Dave and Dave says, uh, be sure to watch the show tonight. 
and I and I get embarrassed and I go, oh, was I caught on camera? You know, because you don't want to be caught coming out of the break doing this to the audience. Looks bad. I said, ah, was I caught on camera? <laughs> and Dave says, yeah, something like that. And it was that they had decided to cut in a set that I had done on one of the two shakedown shows, a stand-up set. And that's what they did. And of course, the great irony of all of this is, and and and, and a perfect encapsulation of my stand-up career was, you know, at the beginning of the Letterman show on CBS, we were doing monster numbers. We were doing 10 million viewers a night. I mean, crazy. You know, it was just a sensation when we came on at CBS. And it's this is the 25th show, <laughs> of course. I'm on this show. And, you know, when it's, you know, when Bill Sheff publishes a novel or when Bill Sheff appears on television, the world yawns. And that's what happened. And it kind of, it became a big story after the fact. And Bill, Bill ran with it. And of course, compounded by the fact that he was dead four months later and nobody knew he was sick except his, you know, his mother and his girlfriend and Colleen, who I loved, who helped, who ran the club in West Palm Beach. And so, you know, for years, you know, people would interview me or they would. And, and of course, it was always sort of cut out my because it didn't it didn't jibe with the narrative that he was censored and all this. And uh, but that's what happened. And then, as you know, years later, Dave had the mother on, had Mary on and re aired the set. And. um and um, uh, so she's on this show uh, and he finishes the interview with her. And, and I used to be off to the side during the taping. and I would entertain the man between com during commercials of his own show was my job. And so he finishes with Mary, the two segments. And I go up to Mary and I say, Hi, Mary, I'm Bill Sheft. And she says, I know who you are, Bill. And and Bill loved you and always said if there was any comic that, you know, he was happy for to have been, he said it was you. Now, this is this woman. I, I couldn't, you know, obviously you can tell I still have trouble dealing with that. But that's the kind of woman she was. You know, so, oh. but that's what happened. That's nice that she gave you that closure. Yeah, well, I mean, I get, yes, yes, it, it was, but, you know, but, you know, thank God you don't live in this head. Of course, it, <laughs> it, it sort of reopened all. I mean, I didn't even think of it until all of a sudden there it is. It's like, oh, my God, this is the thing that I was kind of a, a part of. I, I kind of thought the issue was closed so she opened and closed it let's say well it sounds to me though that <clears throat> while you were a part of it you didn't know you were a part of it so you know I, you don't you know you didn't specifically you weren't given the choice to say hey bill chef we need you to go on for bill hicks and you're like all right i'll do it but i've got you know like where you'd have that drama on your head like should i do this i'm i'm gonna betray him i didn't but it was that i didn't had happen. It was, they just yeah, grabbed the right it was it was a piece of tape in here yeah. that was yeah and it kind of fit perfectly and it was and, yeah. and of course the great irony of all of this was it was if it wasn't the last stand-up set i did when i did the um the shakedown show I didn't do too many more because it was clear that I didn't have to do this anymore to make a living. I think that I'm trying to think, oh, you know what happened? No, I was done. I was not really doing it, but I still remembered the act. And then I went to see Adrian. She was working in Vegas uh, in November at the Trop, and she was sick. So I had to do all 
five shows on the weekend for her. But I still, I mean, the act was still, and that was the last time I did stand up. Yeah. That was that <laughs> next month. Okay. <laughs> wow. 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 Uh, so, let's get it. I hope we get into the next millennium somehow. Yeah. Where do we, where do we want to go? I did want to ask you, um, do you always eat chocolate chip cookies the way they caught you on camera? Not chocolate? chocolate. No, no, no. Those were, those were oatmeal. Oh, it was cookies. oatmeal. I was picking out the raisins and yes, I hate raisins, but the fact that, that, that was, you know, a, a filmed, without my knowledge or consent but of, of course as i said you know the fact that it happened and it got included in that last great barbara Gaines montage on the last show so i'm kind of grateful for that but yes it is yeah Pretty what can i tell you i don't like raisins <laughs> i don't think i can be more clear do not be a raisin um let's talk more about your books so yes. uh Let's talk about you got uh, your latest uh, Tommy Dash. Yeah, it, that what? I would recommend that to you more than all of my other books because that you will relate, you will know the life, you will know some of the characters involved, and basically, it, um, again, this is a good story. So this is me telling, <laughs> right? but uh, so. During the, the strike of 2007, the writer's strike, 2000, uh, everybody got all their information from Deadline Hollywood and from Nikki Fink. And I got to be friends with Nikki. And, um, you know, she sold Deadline Hollywood and made a killing. And part of the agreement of the sale was that she would never report on show business again. That was part of the non-compete. So she's a smart, she's a smart lady. So she said, well, okay, I'll just start a new website where we write fiction about show business. And she reached out to me in like April or March of 2015. And I said, Nikki, I promise I will contribute something, but we're in the last three months of the show. It's all encompassing, but I promise you, I will, you know, contribute something so the show ends luckily her start date is pushed back and she you know show ends in may in june she says well what do you got and i said okay i promised i'd do something for you and and let me think about it so i figured you know anybody can write like 2500 words on some nonsense or whatever i said i need to do something, what we used to call the Letterman show, a refillable, something I can go back to. So I knew there was a great story that I knew that I used to tell about Rich Jenny, the late, great Rich Jenny, one of Mark Ridley's absolute favorite comics. Richard I've seen Jenny. Richard Jenny live twice. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and he and I worked Australia together twice, and he was, you know... He was as funny as he was unhappy. He was, and he was a guy, and you and I know guys like this. The, you and I know guys that really, they should be on stage all the time because they, they cannot handle life off stage. And he was, he was one of those guys. So I, one of the last times I saw him, it was we had worked on the Oscars together for Chris Rock, and and uh, he came back to New York, and I said to him, and he had dinner with me and Adrian, and he loved Adrian, and uh, I said, you know, I've been telling a story about you for years, and I don't even know if it's true or not, and he says, well, what's the story? And so the story that I had heard was that he got hired by Clint Eastwood to do one scene in the movie Bird. And it's it's a dream for a comic. It's one scene, and it's all them. It's the type of thing that a comic can do, you know, comics who aren't actors. So Clint Eastwood is notorious for coming in under budget for eight-hour days on the set and for being totally prepared and 
filming all rehearsals. So here comes Jenny in for his day, right? And and they say, okay, let's let's do a rehearsal. And Jenny does the scene. And Clint Eastwood says, okay, that was that was good, Rich, but could you do it and be just a little less angry? And Jenny, in front of Clint, the cast, and the crew, says, I'm too angry. Here's a guy comes into town, kills everybody. And Clint Eastwood walked by his AD and said, get rid of him. And I tell the story to Jenny, and Jenny says, not only did that happen, but you tell the story better than I do. And I told it at his memorial. So I so I know this story. So I decide that uh, I'm going to create this character, Tommy Dash, who's this unapologetic 60-year-old comic trying to apologize his way back into show business. And the first uh, installment was, is that somebody calls him an agent and says, look, uh, Clint Eastwood wants to see you to read for Sully. And Tommy Dash says to the agent, look, there's a little problem and tells him the story about Bird. And the agent says, well, if you write an apology to Clint Eastwood and put it on the website and you write an apology, you know, maybe. And that's, that was, that was the first chapter. And then I had, there was so many stories like this from my career, my alleged career, that happened to me or other people um, that all of a sudden, these installments, they just kind of, oh, I could do right about that. And it was all set in L.A. And Adrian used to read the stuff. And she said, you're scaring me with how L.A. this is, because we both hate L.A. We both hated L.A. and. So I was so Nikki Fink, she started this website, Hollywood Dementia. And sadly, it did not have the traffic that Deadline did. But I was the most popular writer on the site because I had this series going about Tommy Dash. And he gets a job on a sitcom. And it's and it was a lot of stuff from my life, a lot of stuff from other, you know, I named some names, other names I didn't name. And and I wrote about 10 of these for her. And then I realized, whoa, I've written 25,000 words. That's that's like a third of a book. I can't keep giving this away for free. So, because she wasn't paying any of us. Shock. And uh, but she would always sort of hold out, I'm in meetings with HBO, and you know, that was Nikki. And uh, so I ended up, you know, writing the rest of the the book and it it um i finished it in 2000 uh i was flying along and then my wife got you know sick for good and 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 went to heaven and so i didn't work on it for a while and then i finished it and i i turned it in and my agent you know loved it and and it was giving a little too much information. It was right. It was at sort of at the height of the beginning of me too. And it's not that Tommy Dash is a misogynist. It's just that there's some language in there early on. And some people got a little freaked out by the language in a piece of fiction. And so she stopped sending it out. And 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 once, like half a dozen people have seen it, it kind of kills it for a book. So I didn't do anything with it for years, and then somebody suggested you should do an audio book, and you should read it. And I thought that's a great idea, but I know me, and I don't have the wind to do that. I don't, I just don't physically, I don't think I could do it. And I knew I couldn't do it. So I, I knew this guy, Johnny Heller, who was, I was reintroduced to him and that's all he does. And he's a former comic. We knew each other. We played softball against each other for years. And so he did it and he was connected enough. And so it came out a year ago and it just got, he just got nominated for the book 
for best humor voiceover or whatever the hell. So I'm, you know, and, and you will get a kick out of it and you will get just about everything in the book. That is my next purchase. I'm excited to. Uh, that's, yeah, and that's he does awesome. a great job. He does a great job, Johnny Heller. It seems all your books would make good movies. I think so. But, you know, here's the thing about all my books. They would all make great movies in the 1970s because there is there's sort of, you know, it's that 70s sort of reality relationship. You know, there's a little, it's just that it's, it's the tone of, and I, of course, those are my favorite movies were in the seventies. It's a, it's not as, um, it's not the type of story that gets told today. Although I will say that there was a movie a couple of years ago, uh, based on a book written by somebody I knew, um, it, will you ever forgive me about Lee Israel that who forged famous people's letters. And I knew Lee and my wife was good friends with Lee. And that was, that was a great movie. And that was like a seventies movie. Uh, so, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. So, okay. So you, the only person who was at Letterman longer than you was Steve Young. Correct. Okay. The, well, only, I, writer, I had... the only writer that was at Letterman longer than me was Steve Young. Okay, so I've had I had Steve Young on. I had a great conversation with him. So my oh question my is, God. I share any story you want in one second, but who is there just less than who would be the third person? Like it'd be or the, it would be Steve, then you, then who? I just need Gerard to Mulligan. Gerard Mulligan. Okay, is he alive? I need to get him on the podcast. Yes, he is. He is alive <laughs> and he lives in I'm working my way Jersey. down though. <laughs> he retired. He was with the morning show. He goes all the way back to 1980. He retired. In 2000, was it four? Yeah, 2004. He was there 24 years, but he took some time off. And 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 Steve was, yeah, Steve, Steve and I did more shows. And we're that yeah, we're, we're all it's all about the same amount of time, but Steve did more shows because I took two leaves of absence. And Steve took one. And Gerard took a few, <laughs> but um, no, he's great. And he's really funny and just, he's a wonderful human being and uh, best friends with Chris Elliott. And he's a, yeah. So that, yes, that's correct. Late when the show set, when Dave celebrated 30 years in late night in 2012, they did a top 10 with the longest tenured staffers and at the time i'd been there you know 22 20 years i didn't come close to making that top 10 list not close there were so many people that had been there longer than me wow so people like to stick around uh, well there was great i mean look the man engendered that type of loyalty that's that's the only way to put it that's amazing that's only, yeah i know we've uh we spent a lot of time together. I just have one, uh, couple quick, fast questions for you. Like, do you have like, besides Tom Hanks, favorite or craziest guest that was on Letterman that you may or maybe may Tom, or may Tom not Hanks have. was a very, very, very strong guest. Martin Short was consistently the best guest and guest and Martin Short would do a thing. And there's, there's, it's one of the first things they posted on the Letterman YouTube channel, which is run by Barbara Gaines and Walter Kim, two very good friends of mine. And um, one of the first things they posted was a supercut of all of Martin Short's opening fake compliments to Dave. And he would come out and he would, it would sound like a compliment but it wasn't. And he would come out today and he would say, you know, you, can I just say, you look fantastic. I, you, you have like a boyish, I was watching on the monitor and I said, is Rachel Maddow hosting the show tonight? He would always say something that was like kind, of, kind of insulting. And the, but the best one of all of those was one time he came on, he said, you know, I, I applaud 
the decision you've made to wear your suits tighter. I mean, he would just always, it was, yeah. But there were, there were many great moments and great guests. I mean, and, and I, uh, I covered a lot of them for my favorite moments segment for the YouTube channel, but, but it was uh, it, the, the shows, you know, when you're on for, uh, when you work for that, however many thousands of shows that, you know, 5,000 or however many you remember some stuff so clearly and you can't believe the stuff you've forgotten. And Steve Young has an incredible, you know, almost identic memory. And 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 that yet he would forget stuff. And and um we both worked on the monologue together for the last few years. And um uh we uh um uh, he was, you know, he, he's just there's nobody like him. And and we've had a lot of really out we had a lot of outstanding writers on the show guys that went on to huge careers and but for my money he's the best all-around writer the show ever had because he could do anything he could do anything and he had that sensibility and um yeah do you have any one line that you consider like okay this is the greatest thing i ever wrote at Letterman, like a one line. I, joke. I have, well, there's a couple. Well, every well, I would say that there, uh, like a couple of, like I would say maybe four times a year when I would be working on the monologue, I would say to him, I, "I think, I think you missed this. I think you missed this joke. It would be one of mine." And, and and so if it was four times a year, maybe one out of the four, he would he would say, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. Or, and um, so I'll tell you about, so the last one of those was Pope Francis. He had, he had passed on this joke and I got him to do it and he did it. And it was great. And it was that Pope Francis, who was brand new then said that he would not judge gay priests, but I believe his exact words were, let he who is without sin cast the first musical. And I love that joke. And it, but I'll tell you the greatest joke of mine that he didn't do, and he called me in to tell me was there was a thing that happened. I want to say it was 96, around 95, 96. Some guy sued the Tonight Show. With with Leno, they he sued him because there was a guy that would come out before the show with a T-shirt cannon, and he got hit in the eye with a T-shirt, and he sued the Tonight Show for damages. And my joke was, on the bright side, it's the first time since Johnny left that somebody didn't see a piece of material coming from a mile away, and <laughs> and. <laughs> I get the call. Dave wants to see you. And I come down to his office and he was points to the joke. And he says to me, you, you understand why I can't do this. Do you understand why? I, yeah. And that was it. That was the, end. but I love that joke, obviously, because <laughs> I'm telling you that a great joke. That's that is a great joke. And, and Letterman must have loved it for him to have brought you down. <laughs> Point that out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and, uh, and, uh, but you know, he, he and I, I was very lucky, you know, because he, he's 10 years older than me, but we have the same sensibilities because I was the youngest in my family. So my sensibilities are like 10 years. So we, and we also were both comics. So we had that. So we always, um, and, and, and I was lucky because I could say things to him that other people on the staff could not say. And I don't know why, but I think, and I remember one time I come down there to work in the, on the monologue with him. And I say to him, uh, how you doing? He says, well, I, I went to the ophthalmologist today. And I said, how did that go? And he said, well, the guy told me I wasn't producing enough tears. And I said, have you thought about working for yourself? And uh, it, <laughs> he just stared at me. <laughs> 
Oh, uh, that is so fun. Ah, yes. it sounds like it sounds like it was just amazing. Just all all these stories. I can't thank you enough for hanging out with me and sharing them with me. So well, it's cool. it's my pleasure. You made it very easy, and of course, you know the fact that we had the instant Mark Ridley uh, simpatico connection made it made it easy. But no, it was great fun. It was great fun. I you know uh, I, I don't. Uh, I don't do these things very much. And, uh, uh, you know, sometimes they go okay. And today was certainly one of them. <laughs> I'll take it. They'll be like, uh, on my social media, it went okay. <laughs> yeah. No, nobody got hurt. That's the thing. Nobody got hurt. Uh, thank you so much. It was great. My pleasure, Jeff. It. Yeah. Take care. Take care. Thanks.